Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lin Zhao. I'm from Axon Mobile, and uh, thank you so much for joining our oil spill response knowledge transfer webinar. Uh, this is our webinar 19. This is also uh, the third talk on the oil in the C4 series. And I'm really grateful that uh, we have uh, Dr. Victoria Brogé to uh, come to give a talk. Uh, Dr. Victoria Brogé is a principal emergency management specialist in Shell. Uh, she supports all shell business globally on environmental and the scientific aspect of oil spill response. So um, uh, Victoria will provide uh, more background uh, uh, shortly. Uh, but before I uh, uh, give the floor to Victoria, I'm going to go through some uh, bolts and nuts uh, of uh, the webinar. Uh, so as you know, uh, the timing for our webinar is every first Tuesday of the month from 10 to 11.15 uh, Houston time. And uh, uh, our uh, uh, <laughs> so our uh, speakers will will have uh, an hour to talk, and then we will leave uh, fifteen minutes for questions. Uh, the attendees can only type their questions through Q and A button, and then we will go through the questions after the talk. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, we are going to record the whole webinar. Uh, both audio and the video. I already put a link in the meeting invite. So we are going to put uh, uh, the recordings in the API, uh, API website. Uh, we'll we'll uh, keep updating uh, the recordings uh, in that website. Uh, that's all I need to go through. Now I give the floor to Dr. Brogy. Thank you very much, and it's uh, really a privilege to be speaking to you today and present you Chapter 4, Accidental Spill Mitigation of Oil in the Sea for Inputs, Fate, and Effects book. And um, I have been uh, involved in science of oil spill response for the last 20 years, and I've been uh, privileged to work with and learn from some of the most knowledgeable experts in this field, and you have heard presentations by some of them in this webinar series. So I appreciate excellent conducting this information sharing. My uh, master's was from St. Petersburg State Technical University, and I specialized in modeling of oil spills in Arctic. And then I did my doctoral degree in University of California, and I specialized in optimizing mechanical recovery of oil spills and invented grooved surface for uh, disc and drum skimmers. And for the last uh, 15 years or so, I was working in Shell. I uh, train environmental specialists that may be engaged in emergency response. I manage research and development projects on oil spill response and also support our businesses globally uh, in the contingency planning, uh, responses and natural resource damage assessment to make sure that they have access to all the best technologies. And one exciting thing about this field is that for industry, this is a non-competitive area. So we all work together as companies and collaborate with government and academia and nonprofits and consulting organizations to develop these response techniques and share this information freely and bring it to other countries because we are all interested to have as good as a preparedness as we can have it and make sure that we respond to all fields as a community quickly and effectively. So I'm really proud to be a part of this community. Um, also, I uh, sit on uh, different trade association committees that are developing different guides and uh, translating the research findings into practical recommendations for skill responders. I'm uh, chairing um, uh, board of Directors for Clean Caribbean and Americas. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing oil spill response information and best practices across Americas. And I am also very honored to be a chair of the 2024 International Oil Spill Conference. And I would like to invite all of you next May to New Orleans. It will be our first in-person meeting in the last seven years. 
And that will be the place where all the greatest and latest emergency response information and oil spill science is shared. So I very much looking forward to that event. And uh, this oil in the C4 is my third uh, project with National Academies. So today I am not speaking on behalf of myself uh, or Shell. Today I am speaking on behalf of National Academies and uh, my esteemed co-authors for this publication. If you attended the last two presentations, you would know that National Academies uh, conducted these studies to uh, look at inputs, fate, and effects of oil in the sea since 75, and has three reports that it released already. And it has been 20 years since the last report. So obviously a lot of things happened in 20 years and our work was cut out for the team to update uh, these reports and uh, cite all the advanced inventions and advancements in this field, as well as to make recommendations of what can be done going forward. So this is how oil, C, uh, oil in the C4 uh, is in the context of other reports. And this has been a very interesting project because it started in fall of uh, 2020, all right, uh, during COVID time. I think it may be a first uh, National Academy report uh, produced completely virtually. We uh, met a 17 member committee uh, monthly, only virtual meetings. I haven't met um, most of my co-authors in person. And uh, we were able to uh, discuss and share information virtually. We have um, had invited talks uh, from uh, industry experts, from academia, from uh, indigenous communities, from various consultants, and we were supported by three consulting team. So we had 58 invited speakers. And uh, once the report was drafted, it was additionally reviewed by 13 additional experts. So we wanted to make sure that we collect all the knowledge uh, that exists in our uh, field and, and our community and make it available to public. And of course, we would like to thank uh, sponsors of the study that you can see on the screen. Without them, this uh, publication would not be possible. And uh, I just want to show you how it looks like. Um, if my screen allows. So it's 500 pages publication. It's very comprehensive with quite a bit of nice illustrations. And what's important that it's available for free online. If you go to National Academies, you can download it for free and it covers uh, many uh, very good topics. And we make references to more than a thousand uh, peer reviewed publications. So we summarized a lot of information for you in a very uh, digestible format. So today I'll just highlight uh, some of the um, key topics discussed in chapter four. Uh, here you can see our committee. Uh, we were chaired by Kirsi Tika and Ed Levine. And the committee really was very, very interdisciplinary because as you know, emergency response and oil spill response is a very complex topic. That's why we had experts in uh, air science, in uh, human health, uh, modeling, chemistry, spill statistics, uh, microbiology, toxicology, uh, environmental resources, wildlife management, and so on. So it's been a really great privilege to work with these great scientists, and I learned a lot from them. And as a result, we are happy to present you our combined consensus uh, conclusions. Report structure follows these questions. What is oil and where oil in the sea comes from? That's what you heard in previous uh, series, chapters two and three. Today, I will focus on chapter four, spill response. And then I subsequently, you will hear uh, about chapter four and five where oil goes, uh, fate, and impacts. And I want to highlight that this is the first report of this National Academy series that includes a standalone considerable response chapter. And also this report significantly expanded on human health impacts. So that's two very important topics that were added. So now if we look at what has happened uh, in uh, response and prevention, 
we need to acknowledge that the best response is the one you never have to have. So prevention is absolutely a key. For example, salvage operations are very important to oil in the sea concept because it prevents uh, or reduces significant volume, volumes of oil to entering into environment, uh, by, therefore protecting it and reducing the need for spill response. So these technologies are very important in a pipeline, in spill prevention from pipeline onshore and offshore in the last 20 years, there has been considerable improvements. And altogether, uh, they resulted in, let's say, let's last five years in US, there was a 36% reduction in number of spills causing environmental impact, despite the fact that pipeline um, production grew uh, by 10% uh, for miles and barrels delivered. So all these prevention techniques, they do help, and there's a statistics to show it. And when we talk about prevention measures, it's never about just one technique. It's always a complex system between people, technology, and equipment. And if we look at, uh, let's say, equipment and pipelines, there are a variety of technology that are used these days to prevent spills. It's integrity monitoring, for example, using smart peaks, which are the sensors that go inside the pipeline, and they can monitor its integrity and give alerts if, uh, let's say, walls got thinner or maybe there is a crack, so that pipeline can be replaced before spill occurs. And of course, if there is a leak that might happen, then there is a variety of leak detection techniques uh, and uh, technologies that can be installed inside and outside of pipeline that can give a quick alert to uh, an operator and a system can be shut off to prevent uh, large volumes of oil entering the environment. And I won't list you all the different techniques that uh, are used uh, for this in offshore and uh, onshore pipelines. I invite you to um, see some of the references provided in the book. And not only technologies itself got improved and communication and the data processing, but also we are really now looking into it as a system that includes risk management and safety assurance, investigation and lessons learned sharing and staff uh, competence and training. So all of this really is being looked at the system and now there is a more and more formal way to ensure all these components are in place and that our prevention is uh, robust. If we look in wells uh, and source control, obviously after Deepwater Horizon, there has been considerable effort to improve uh, well safety and uh, ways to close uh, the source from offshore installation should the release occur. So that resulted in great advances in blowout prevention and source control technologies. Uh, organizations, for example, in the US, like Center for Offshore Safety was established to ensure this information gets disseminated to uh, interested parties. And you see on the image here, a picture uh, of um, tapping stock. These are new pieces of equipment that were invented and built around the globe to uh, be able to install them on the top of well that may be experiencing loss of, loss of, of uh, control and uh, shut the well in to make sure oil stuff coming into the environment. So several of those consorts are owing a variety of the scapping stacks um, specifically tailored to different high pressure and high flow environment, high temperature environment. So this is a great improvement in capabilities that we didn't have before. And of course, especially after Deepwater Horizon, there has been a great number of new rules and regulations for offshore exploration and production in US and in Canada, as well as other countries. And I just list a few here because I cannot uh, go into great details. But uh, something that is important is that there is never only one barrier between oil and environment, because if this barrier fails, then oil will be free to uh, be discharged. So there is always now a requirement for two independent barriers. It may be a drilling mud weighing the liquids down into the borehole, as well as there may be blowout preventer. And usually there are several of them. 
to make sure that no failure of any one barrier results in a spill. There are very rigorous uh, testing, inspection, and certification of well uh, completion activities and well control equipment. There are exercises. One was just completed in Gulf of Mexico recently when these capping stacks are taken out of the warehouse and deployed from the vessels in the sea to make sure that they are working and they can be used in a real world environment. There are also real time monitoring centers uh, that are used when uh, some high-risk drilling activities are taking place. And even if somebody is drilling on Alaska, the same data that the command post in Alaska would see will be transmitted maybe to Houston and New Orleans and will be monitored by different sets of experts. And anybody that involved, they have a stop work authority. So if anybody on the platform sees that something is not right, something that may result in an accident, they have authority to stop the work regardless of the consequences. And of course, there is new reporting uh, requirements. And again, just like with pipelines, there is a much greater focus now on human factors because our equipment is getting better and better, but we are all humans and we make mistakes. So there is a lot of training and scientific advances going into making sure that people are well trained and they have procedures and conditions to uh, work as effectively as they can. So now if we move from prevention to actual response, uh, we can acknowledge that incident command system uh, is really a standard, gold standard for emergency management and it allows to integrate between many different interested parties and use uh, resources most effectively, make decisions most effectively, and really ensure that our response is as efficient as possible. And not only it's used in the US and Canada, but it's also is adopted by many countries in some modified format sometime, but this was really tested as a robust system. Also, we have uh, benefited from great advances in computer science and digital information processing. So, um, Common operating picture is our way to gather information from different sources and display it in a command post and across virtual organization that may be monitoring and supporting spill response from different locations in the world. Now they all have convenient way to see the same information, see the resources, uh, see which actions are being taken and contribute. And of course, with all the digital tools uh, past COVID, now we see uh, great improvements in this virtual responses when we don't all have to be in one room. You can uh, do this work uh, virtually. Also, we acknowledge that uh, classification of coastal environments and environmental sensitivity indexes are very helpful for emergency responses. And again, they also go uh, digital and there is a uh, different uh, projects to um, digitize them and make them available in different formats, not just as hard copy maps, but digitally. We also advanced our risk assessment tools of how we evaluate different scenarios and how we choose the response technique that would be most effective under specific conditions. And of course, uh, again, back to advances in IT and computing technologies, in addition to remote sensing, I would say spill modeling uh, and analytical methods, that's what's so greatest advances. Our models and numerical models getting smarter and smarter, and they're more integrated with atmospheric and oceanographic models, they uh, run faster and with greater resolutions. And now we can uh, transfer this information easier than ever before. And of course, remote sensing and monitoring uh, in field uh, is uh, getting better, not just operationally, but also monitoring for environmental impacts. And I'll mention um, in the end of my presentation about uh, improvements in wildlife management that we have seen over the years. And one of the key uh, concepts in emergency response is, of course, a response toolbox. It's a recognition that we have a variety of response tools uh, and none of them is perfect under every situation. We have to see uh, dispersants use institute situ burning, mechanical recovery, shoreline response, natural att attenuation as really a toolbox that we have access to and we can pick from depending on the need. And we acknowledge in the report 
that emergency response, it's kind of similar to medical profession. Just as doctors, we may be faced with a situation that we wish we didn't have, but there are professionals that spend their whole careers, 20, 40 years, studying specific aspects and components of emergency response. And they collectively bring their expertise to help make this situation less bad. So we would evaluate different treatment techniques, medically and political response speaking. We would weigh their advantages and disadvantages and side effects. And collectively, using all of our tools, be able to pick one that is most effective under the situations to protect people and environment and result in the fastest ecosystem and societal recovery. So this is a very important concept that I think most people uh, recognize right now. Something that also we acknowledge is that development of all of these tools require a lot of collaboration of different disciplines and consistent level of funding. Unfortunately, in emergency response, we see this boom and bust of funding when there is a lot of funding that came after Deepwater Horizon and great research programs uh, like Gomery were established and MPRI in Canada. But now 10 years later, we may see a decline. And then some of the researchers that got uh, expertise in this topic, they may transition to another uh, topics and another fields. And we would lose some of this expertise. Emergency response professionals may choose to go and work somewhere else. So it's very important to maintain consistent level of funding that throughout the years would help our community to develop better and better tools and make sure that we integrate all the advances in science and computation technology into our work. Another topic that is very important is field experiments. As you can even see on this illustration, emergency response at sea especially, it's not something that you can simulate in a laboratory beaker. The scales we work with, they are very large, and it's just simply not possible to recreate ocean waves in a laboratory beaker. And that's what challenges a lot of the data interpretation. That's what hampers a lot of uh, advancements in the technology and frankly creates quite a bit of unnecessary controversy about between scientists arguing about um, extrapolation of their experiments to the field. If we could do field experiments with real oil, this could all be much easier. Unfortunately, in the US currently, we cannot conduct experiments with oil. And in some other countries like Canada and Norway, it's been very difficult to get those permits. And we are grateful when we get this opportunity. But this is something that our committee recognized that would really help to continue to advance oil spill response techniques. So if we look at uh, different tools in our toolbox one by one and just discuss what advances have we seen in the last 10, 20 years and also what else need to be done, it's described in detail in the report, but this is something that I can highlight in my presentation. As far as oil uh, on water observation, it's not just about monitoring where the oil slick is. Yes, there are overflights and sensors and missions that help us to delineate the sleep and the coverage and maybe thickness in some situations. But we also use remote sensing and monitoring to verify, um, for example, satellite imagery and determine whether it was oil or an artifact. We can also do fingerprinting of uh, different um, sleeks to determine the source. Also monitoring and remote sensing supports a strategic and tactical oil spill response techniques. It can uh, direct mechanical recovery vessels to the uh, thickest portions of the oil, so they can be 100 times more effective. And also they can uh, help dispersants plane find patches of the sleek where dispersants can be most effective. Also remote sensing is uh, used for monitoring of presence and absence of wildlife in the area, not just in contaminated area, but around it. Uh, we are, can also monitor social economic uh, resources, uh, marinas and beach to see how uh, the use of uh, those resources have changed over time. It can help with shoreline cleanup assessment 
uh, techniques. Uh, the techniques themselves uh, for shoreline been in existence for decades, but now there are advances in using a kind of electronic scat and underwater scat was developed for uh, sunken oil in near shore area. And even canin scat, when now we are, can use dogs to detect different concentrations of oil in the beach. So there's a variety of the missions that uh, remote sensing is used for. And if we think about the technologies, we have platforms that we can put sensors on, and them both have seen a pretty considerable improvement. So of course we have satellites and helicopters and planes and uh, that we can put sensors on, but now with the development of drone technologies, we can uh, also use them for a rapid assessment uh, of the situation. And also we've seen development in the sensors that we can put on those platforms, like infrared and ultraviolet and hyperspectral, and they get better and better, not just acquiring data, but analyzing and transmitting the data. And of course, uh, just like with the response toolbox in remote sensing toolbox, there is a variety of tool and sensors and not any one of them is perfect for each situation. That's why the best remote sensing and monitoring program is the one that combines all platforms and all relevant sensors and integrates them together. And as a recent improvements, there are now uh, commercial planes that integrate many of the sensors together allow to process all this information at once and have this comprehensive view of the situation. And um, other types of uh, improvement and development that we acknowledge uh, was done for Arctic condition. In the last 20 years, there have been significant interest to Arctic exploration. And uh, there has been several studies, I would mention Arctic Response Technology Joint Industry Project that generated a lot of uh, knowledge and good summaries uh, on this topic. That's why we didn't feel like we need to include extensive discussion about this into our report, but we reference them uh, if you're interested in this information. So if we have oil in ice, we have several uh, techniques also that we can be used. Uh, surface ground penetrating crater has shown its effectiveness for oil under ice. Uh, Dogs have been tested uh, in Arctic conditions and they can detect oil kilometers away under snow. Uh, also, ground penetrating radar have been tested uh, from helicopter and showed some promise. And as well, there are some underwater techniques that can allow us to detect oil under ice. So again, a variety of uh, different strategies. You just need to reach out to specialists in this topic so they can advise you which of these techniques would be most uh, relevant in the specific conditions. So if we go into response techniques themselves, it cannot be stated enough that safety of public and responders is of paramount importance in emergency response. We would not do anything to hurt people. And mechanical recovery in the marine environment is a pretty dangerous um, situation. And of course, it's done by professionals using best response uh, tools and vessels and all the appropriate PPE. But we do need to recognize that these are people working in offshore conditions that can be challenging. They are working in oil exposed to environment and exposed to uh, volatile hydrocarbons. So really, we should consider minimizing exposure to people as much as possible if the same can be achieved through other response technique. I think this topic was uh, underemphasized in the past, but uh, with this publication and significant section on human health impact, I think this topic that really need to be uh, considered uh, more carefully. So if it is not safe to deploy mechanical recovery at sea, oftentimes natural attenuation and biodegradation can be a very good response option. And for example, if it's a spill of light condensate or a small diesel spill offshore, it will biodegrade naturally. And it's a much better option than sending vessels uh, uh, to the site, burning Use uh, uh, hydrocarbons on the way they're creating air emissions, exposing people to risk, recovering this uh, little bit of a product with potentially a lot of water, then transferring it back to the shore. 
and storing and disposing it. So mechanical recovery, just like any other response technique, should really be considered from cradle to grave. And environmental and socioeconomic analysis of it has to be considered as a whole. You cannot just say, well, my schema shows that I can recover X uh, gallons per minute. It sounds good. I'm going to go for it. Because mechanical recovery really works as a system. As a person that spent four years of a PhD thesis developing schemers, I can tell you it's not about schemers, it's about the system. We are working against physics because oil spreads so thin and so fast in open ocean that it's very difficult to corral it back. And for us to recover it, we have to corral it. That's why we are using these booms, these floating fences to bring oil in and feed it to our recovery devices. So our recovery devices are a lot more capable than the amount of oil they realistically see in the field. So this needs to be considered as a system and the focus has been in developing this equipment in improving encounter rates. How much, how much oil can we bring uh, into booms and recover to make it effective. And another improvement was in uh, improving mechanical recovery in ice. When oil is collected between ice cakes, ice flows, you don't have to use boom. You can reach out into those pockets and pick up oil using skimmers and special types of Arctic skimmers uh, being developed and as well as pumping and processing for uh, cold oil or heavy oil. So there has been considerable advances, but we should not forget that the mechanical recovery of large spills offshore is always limited by the encounter rate of how much oil they are seeing. And also, mechanical recovery only works in relatively calm seas, let's say under six feet of wave height, because once it goes higher than that, not only booms start failing and collecting oil, but there's really no oil on the surface because it's being dispersed. So mechanical recovery has some limitations and historically anecdotal kind of saying was that for large offshore spills, mechanical recovery picks up less than 10% of, this, of the release. And some recent studies show that it's actually much less than 10%. So mechanical recovery alone cannot uh, be uh, completely relied on to remove large offshore oil spill. This is why we need to consider other techniques for the offshore. That said, mechanical recovery will always be considered and it will be effective, especially closer to the shore, in the ports, in calm areas, and close to the large collection of uh, response resources. So if we look at other response techniques, what we can consider over decades of research in situ burning, burning of oil in place have shown a great promise and really uh, proven itself as a response technique. It uh, has been used with great success uh, during Deepwater Horizon. It, uh, they conducted about 400 burns and burned a volume of oil that's larger than Exxon Valdez oil spills, and they did it safely for people and for environment. So this is a really uh, good technique that can be used under some conditions in spill response. And there are several ways to use this technique. We can either burn oil when it's collected inside of a fireproof boom offshore, or it can be burned in a marshes. If oil got into marsh, it can be a very effective and environmentally friendly way to remove oil. Um, in situ burning is especially a useful tool in the Arctic because oil weathers pretty quickly and emulsifies quickly in um, open water in temperate climate. But in Arctic, especially when it sits between ice, it remains fresh for a longer period of time and uh, considerably thicker because ice flows don't allow it to spread, which makes uh, this opportunity for us to ignite it and burn it, and it potentially burnable for a much longer window than in temperate climates. So oil collected between ice or oil pushed against ice age, that can be a very good scenario for in-situ burning. Again, if environmental conditions are allowed, and we always monitor for a potential environmental impacts. This technique requires regulatory approvals 
it requires a robust monitoring uh, for air emissions and also monitors uh, monitoring of impacts in the water column. Uh, so it uh, always uh, accompanies uh, in-situ burning. Something that is very exciting and most recent development in this field is the use of herders. Herders are specially designed uh, low toxicity chemicals that can be applied at very small quantities around the slick, and it allows slick to contract and reach a higher thickness that's needed for in-situ burning. And then it can be ignited without the use of booms and oil can be eliminated quickly that way. So most recent development is to integrate this herding and burning technology into uh, these jet ski vehicles that can be deployed uh, offshore and can move very quickly. And then without a need for people to be there because they are remotely operated, they can apply further and from the same vehicle you can uh, throw uh, an ignited uh, gelled gasoline and ignite the slick. So they can maneuver between different slicks quickly and ignite it. So this is one of the latest and greatest uh, technique uh, that we have right now. Herders have been in existence since 70s and they restyled it quite a bit. And there has been renewed interest in herders uh, related to Arct Arctic exploration and cleanup of oil in ice. But now with this new uh, jet ski technology, it has an additional promise that may improve overall effectiveness of in-situ burning uh, in Arctic and in temperate condition. And this uh, prototype of jet ski was just tested last month in Alaska in artificial lakes, and it ignited, heard it and ignited sleek and really showed uh, itself as a very useful tool. So we hope that we will be able to test it in the field condition at some point of time soon. Um, dispersants is a very uh, controversial tool in spill response, and I would argue just so. And we, uh, in our report, decided not to go in all the details about dispersion science because uh, there were several recent publications that provide a very detailed overview of dispersion science. So I will refer you to a publication by the National Academy of Science called uh, The Use of Dispersions in Marine Oil Spill Response that was released in uh, 2020. Uh, also, the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat report, State of the Knowledge of Chemical Dispersions for Canadian Marine Oil Spills by DFO, released in 2021. And also, uh, there was a Government Accountability Office uh, in the US report on dispersions and several other publications that can uh, cover dispersion science and impacts in much greater details. For uh, this uh, report, we focused on operational parameters and effectiveness of use, and then there was would be more discussion about it in our effects uh, section and some in fates. So while not very comprehensive, really reviewed in this particular report, we do provide all the latest references for uh, detailed information if you're interested. And here I just want to highlight that dispersion is a very natural process and oil will be dispersing at sea, whether we use dispersants or not. And some of the light oil spills, especially in high seas, may completely disperse naturally. And of course, if you have a blowout, significant portion of that oil coming from the well will be dispersed naturally. And in case of a condensate, for example, spill, maybe the entire slick will be dispersed. So dispersants were really designed to work with nature and there are low toxicity chemicals specifically designed to work at sea that we can apply from planes, helicopters, vessels, or inject into blowout. And they help oil to be broken into very tiny droplets that are diluted in marine environment and uh, biodegraded by naturally present uh, bacteria. And we really have a benefit of applying dispersants, especially from planes, compared to mechanical recovery or in-situ burning, because planes are much quicker to get to the site and they can treat much greater area quicker than uh, vessels for mechanical recovery or in-situ burning that may take hours to get to the site and they uh, are much slower to maneuver because of how carefully they have to advance with booms to collect oil in the apex. So the 
the encounter rate of dispersal separations and spraying from the plane is much greater. And also dispersants can work in much higher seas than mechanical recovery or in situ burning. So in some situations, it may be the only response option. And latest and greatest is the use of subsea dispersants um, injection right into the well at the point of release subsea. It was used in the port of horizon and showed good effectiveness. And this technique is particularly interesting for us because it allows us to control injection and dispersant application in one manageable point. So we can tailor the dose while at surface we spray dispersion at 1 to 20 ratio. Sub C we can go as low as 1 to 100, potentially 1 to 200. So we can use less dispersions in one manageable point at the place where oil is freshest and most uh, turbulent conditions that really promote uh, effective droplet formation. If you think about surface spills and oil weathering, in a matter of few days, oil may become too emulsified and viscous for this person to work. So surface application only have a um, few days maybe worth of operations before oil become more dispersible and it can only work daylight hours. So if it's a blowout, then each night uh, there is more oil released and each day you have a bigger spill. Subsea dispersant injection can work 24 seven and any weather condition, and it allows oil to be diluted in the deeper environment when there is a lot of um, water for dilution. So if environmental conditions allow, this person can be a very uh, valuable technique. Another improvement is um, this person's use in ice condition. Um, there has been studies and field demonstrations to invent special application equipment that allows spraying dispersants between ice flows. Instead of just spraying on top of ice, it can be maneuvered to spray between ice and use of prop wash to disperse oil uh, in a broken ice field that also showed promise. And of course, we are benefiting from all the monitoring and remote sensing technology. Dispersant operations are accompanied, always accompanied by regulatory approvals and oversight. So we uh, always as a community, I have to do a robust monitoring in the water column and from the air when dispersants are used. And now there are specific instructions from uh, governments on how to do it. And industry as a co-op, uh, they established uh, ready to go sampling kits, for example, for subsea dispersants. Not only we have idea of how to do sampling, but we have standby scientists with very comprehensive packages suitable for deep sea deployment that can monitor water column, um, take water column samples and uh, do this uh, monitoring even in the deep water. So great advances in this regard. It has to be mentioned though that dispersants is not always the techniques that should be used, that should be considered, but there are situations when dispersant will be not a good technique. And we also highlight in the report that it shouldn't be used, for example, in estuarine environment when there is no dilution and no water movement or a lot of sediment. We don't want to disperse oil in this situation because we don't want oil to stick to sediment and precipitate to the bottom. Uh, we cannot um, disperse oil in a situation when there is no dilution or when there is limited biodegradation. So in the report, we talk about these limiting factors that can limit application of dispersants. And there is a quite a bit of controversy in the literature, and you may hear it on the TV or newspapers about dispersants and why scientists can't agree whether it's a good technique or not. And what is interesting, it's actually not about dispersants and even not about oil or spill response. It's about our limited ability to represent ocean environment in the laboratory conditions. That's where the challenge comes from. For example, if you think about effectiveness and how would you test the effectiveness of, uh, let's say, dispersants at sea, well, oil undergoes uh, weathering processes and the changes, and these conditions alone are very difficult to simulate in a laboratory condition. But also dispersion itself, let's say on surface, is driven by surface oceanographic waves. And that's something that's impossible to simulate in a laboratory in the beaker. So 
to meet this kind of to address this need, scientists are coming up with the proxy uh, setups that may simulate one portion of certain big scale process that allows them to study this process. For example, for effectiveness, uh, scientists may put oil in a beaker and spin it carefully or shake it and use that uh, to see how different dispersants work. And it allows them to compare one oil to another oil or one dispersant to another dispersant, but it has uh, very limited relevance of how this dispersion would actually happen in the real event in field conditions. So it has to be recognized that if you look at effectiveness tests, you should ask not which dispersion they used, but which tests they used, because it can vary 50% uh, or 100% in effectiveness, depending which uh, test you use and how hard you shook that bottle. Same thing with biodegradation. If you wanted to study biodegradation of uh, dispersed oil, uh, these are processes that happens on parts per billion, parts per trillion scale in the ocean over days, weeks, or months. And we just don't have this capability in chemistry and analytics to study these processes at the scales. So scientists have to pack up a lot more oil in the beaker and try to study it there. By doing so, they create conditions that are not representative of the field. And again, it allows us to compare different maybe uh, fertilizers to each other or compare different oils, but not really directly predict what will happen at sea. Because in this situation, oxygen may be limiting, nutrients may be limiting, something that would not happen at sea. And here in the diagrams, I'm showing uh, illustration of the same point for toxicity studies, which are especially controversial for dispersants. If you look at... Um, these experiments in laboratory conditions, and I'm showing here uh, large fish, but of course uh, in the laboratory condition, we are testing larvae and fish eggs because we want the most sensitive organisms to be tested. So when oil is just sitting on top of the aquarium, it may not affect uh, fish but or larvae, but when you disperse it, it's now more bi bioavailable in, the, in this uh, beaker and it doesn't change oil chemistry or toxicity, it just makes it more bioavailable as this person intended. But in the sea, it will be very quickly diluted, while in the laboratory, this beaker may sit there with this constant high concentration for 96 hours and monitor how many organisms would die. And it's done on purpose because this test uh, creates this steady state condition that allows scientists to compare oil to oil dispersants to dispersants, further to further, chemical to chemical. But again, this cannot be extrapolated to impacts in the real world, because if you look at the real world, not only oil naturally dilutes in a matter of hours, but also organisms are afraid to move. So now we have models that allow us to take these results from laboratory tests and then model what would happen in an uh, in environment. And that's a very important step that people may forget so when scientists are saying, well, how can my research be more relevant? How can you use it in decision makers, in decision making? Uh, committee uh, acknowledges that the experiments need to be clearly described of what you're trying to simulate. If you can explain to the reader how you designed the experiments and how it relates or doesn't relate to the real life environment, it would make it much easier for us to integrate between studies, make sense of them and integrate it into the big picture. Unfortunately, when there is no consistent approach of how this big ocean is simulated in a laboratory, individual studies use methods that are not compatible. And as a result, there is perceived conflict of information and it doesn't allow all of us to integrate all the studies together and for decision makers to make an informed decision based on available science. And this is why work uh, like by Canadian government or national academies that reviews the thousands of studies and try to make sense of them are very important because in this case, it's really all about context and it's something that should not be forgotten. So committee wants to emphasize the importance of consistent protocols and analyzing properly chemistry and other factors and reporting the results in the way it can be uh, 
easier to integrate into um, analysis and decision making. So every effort is uh, being made to clean up oil offshore, because once oil come to near shore environment, it becomes uh, a totally different story. Offshore, we have a lesser organism density and more opportunity for oil to dilute. Once you come near shore, that's where we often see a concentration of the younger uh, forms of organisms and higher organisms density. And also that's where people are present and that's where greatest impact on wildlife and humans, physical and psychological impact may be observed. So while every effort is made to clean up oil offshore, sometimes it doesn't succeed. And then we need to discuss what we are going to do if oil comes closer to the shore. And we try to uh, deploy protective booming, but as practice shows, it cannot cover very large area. You cannot string a boom parallel to the shore through the entire Gulf Coast and call it protected. This is actually not how it works. You have to be very strategic and deploy protective booming in specific areas that uh, you want to protect but it will not be very large areas. And if oil gets to the shoreline, there is a variety of cleanup techniques can be used, but it's important to acknowledge that they sometimes can do more harm than good. That's why sometimes in a marsh environment, letting oil to biodegrade naturally, or maybe doing in situ burning, may be a better technique than uh, bringing in heavy machinery and tramping all over the marsh. So in the report, we highlight some of these uh, more advanced technique like burning and use of surface washing agents and biomediation agents. And uh, I know there's always a fascination with bacteria and people are asking, should we add bacteria to the sea to help clean up oil? And I think a general consensus that you don't need to add bacteria to marine environment. There are natural bacteria present that can biodegrade oil. And on shoreline uh, environment, it's rarely needed, but it could be enhanced by adding fertilizers or uh, tilting soil or doing surface washing to provide naturally existing bacteria with uh, oxygen and nutrients that they need to do the work. And something that's uh, very important for shoreline cleanup is that it's the longest lasting uh, cleanup operations, usually in spill response, because it involves a lot of people. It takes a lot of effort. It exposes a lot more people, potentially public to oil, and it creates a lot of waste. So waste management and logistics is a very important consideration when uh, we are choosing shoreline cleanup techniques. So you will hear some of these uh, discussions. We'll read some of the discussions in, in the book. So as I mentioned, there is a variety of response techniques and they're not perfect. They all have advantages and disadvantages. And I mentioned that there are professionals that have experience with these techniques and they can advise depending on the situation, uh, which one would be better to use. But also we have a formal methods to allow us to do this analysis and ranking and document it so public can be assured that we did factor in all the potential drawbacks, potential impacts from dispersants and dispersed oil in the water column, potential impacts of in situ burning. So that we did factor it in and the, if we decided to use certain response technique, they would know that we considered everything and still as a community decided that this response technique is the most effective under situation. It protects environmental people better and it will facilitate faster ecosystem recovery. So over the years, we use the term net environmental benefit analysis, and it's a concept of do no harm. Don't do anything that would make it worse for the environment. And it can be implemented in a variety of days, in a variety of ways. So uh, in the US, EPA and NOAA and Coast Guard have used this risk assessment matrix and a method of consensus ecological risk assessment uh, for years to do this analysis. And lately, uh, recently in 2017, IPCA, IOGP, and API proposed a new method. It's more computational, numerical calculation uh, called uh, spill impact mitigation assessment, 
that's another method that can be used uh, for formal assessment. And also industry conducted, I think, two or three by now comparative risk assessments. This is a method that's more uh, based on numerical simulations. So there is a variety of methods that we can employ and they advance uh, in their uh, kind of technology and uh, practical applications in the last 10 to 20 years, but they all are based on the same uh, principle. So the, the assumption is that oil is already in the environment and that we need to do something to mitigate the situation that we want to consider all feasible response options. We don't want to exclude anything. We need to recognize that all response options, burning, dispersants, mechanical recovery, doing nothing, they have uh, their limits and they all need to be considered and as well as their realistic effectiveness need to be considered. So we factor all of this in, we look at resources at risks, ecological resources, socioeconomic resources, uh, spiritual, cultural resources, and we. One of the key components of all these uh, studies is to bring stakeholders in and uh, resource trustees, and as a community, look at all of the resources and decide which response tools will be a better protection. And it's key that we are not focusing on one individual organisms. We are not trying to save the larvae at the expense of birds, for example. We are truly focusing on most sensitive organisms, on the slower to recover populations, and uh, most importantly, on the habitats. Because if habitat is healthy and some populations got affected, they will recover. If habitat is destroyed, then that larvae may not be able to live long because it has nowhere to go to. So there are these robust tools uh, that uh, now are used in the community, not just in US and Canada, but globally, that allow us to demonstrate to our stakeholders our due diligence and the depth of the analysis that went into selection of these response techniques. And I want to cover one last response technique, it's uh, wildlife management. Um, Let's say 20, 30 years ago, uh, wildlife management was done by few nonprofit organizations, kind of on ad hoc basis by few enthusiasts. But recently, it became absolutely critical and integrated uh, technique in emergency response. And now it's integrated into preparedness and it's not just response. So, one of the greatest projects that was done lately in the last 10 years since Deepwater Horizon. It's a global oil wildlife response system project. It's GOWERS. When 11 leading uh, wildlife management organizations from seven countries got together and they developed uh, this international framework for supporting each other and for wildlife response. They developed uh, recommendation and best practices documents for animal care and guidelines. Uh, they developed standards and instructions for how to do a uh, wildlife response. So this uh, is available online, and if you're interested, you can review. This was a great improvement in approach to wildlife management that consists of many different components. It's, it includes keeping oil away from the wildlife. It includes keeping wildlife away from oil as primary and the secondary response technique. And then as a ter tertiary response technique, that's what you're seeing on the screen. It's actually what people think about wildlife response. It's a search, collection, cleanup, and rehabilitation of organisms that involves a lot of people and, and effort. And there's often a question, well, is it worth it? Is cleaning birds really worth it? And while there was some mixed uh, reviews in the earlier literature, I think more recent conclusion that it is, if it's done right, and uh, wildlife is truly integrated in the preparedness. And yes, if it's done right, it will result in positive uh, impact on the wildlife situation in the area. I also want to acknowledge that after Deepwater Horizon, uh, NOAA uh, National Marine Fisheries, they established national procedures for citations, pinnipeds, and sea turtles. So that was also very uh, useful information that uh, is available online. And uh, after Deepwater Horizon, we certainly have a better understanding of impacts of dispersants and dispersed oil and oil on uh, different uh, organisms. So as uh, conclusions from the response chapter in oil and sea core, 
I, I emphasize that source control and prevention is a priority, as well as protection of uh, responders and public. Incident command system uh, has been very instrumental in making response effectiveness. I introduce you to the response toolbox concepts and all the different tools that we have available. We talked about criticality of continuous funding for oil spill research throughout the years uh, and the importance of field experiments. So we don't struggle this much with this extrapolation of research results uh, from the lab into the field conditions. And we are benefiting and will continue to benefit from advances in remote sensing, monitoring, modeling, and uh, data management and other computer-related technologies. Something that uh, you will also see throughout the book is we acknowledge that in addition to crude oil, now we see new uh, products and specifically new fuel oil types or like low sulfur fuel oil, for example, that has a different composition from crude oil or from conventional products. And oftentimes we are not sure what the composition is because it's mixed at uh, very different uh, rates in different places. So this is something that we recommend continuing to study as far as fate and response options uh, and effects. And you will hear a presentation about health and safety risks, uh, physical and psychological uh, impacts to humans. This is a very significant portion of the report. And uh, looking into the future, this, uh, if you go to the report, you will see for each chapter, there are specific recommendations. So if you're in science or research or academia, you will be able to benefit from this discussion. Uh, and we again recommend uh, field experimentations to improve our spill response tools and gather relevant information, uh, understanding new fuel types, a lifetime life cycle analysis of oil spills based on different scenarios. It's very difficult to make a decision when you don't have information about outcomes of all response tools. If we do mechanical recovery, what would happen? If we do dispersions, what will happen? When researchers are focusing only on small components of each of these response scenarios, it's not possible to integrate them together. So integration uh, would be something that will help us in decision making. Continuing to study health and psychological risks to response professionals and the public. Of course, continuous improvement in response tools and uh, continuous investment into world wildlife management. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and take any questions that you may have. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roger. Oh, oh my God, that's, um, that's a really great uh, presentation. Like, you know, give a very clear uh, you know, information about the, uh, you know, response to, so et cetera. And uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm really uh, grateful about this. And, um, oh, before we uh, go through the questions, uh, so I like to, before everybody leave, I want to uh, say that our next webinar will be... <clears throat> Also, uh, one of the Oil in the C4 series. Uh, so it will focus on the chemistry and the fate. Uh, so the presenters are uh, John Farrington and uh, Scott, uh, Scott Saklavsky and Baron Tenso. So stay tuned. And uh, now, so we, it seems we ha already have uh, some questions coming in. So I will uh, go through those questions uh, first. Yeah. Uh, excellent uh, presentation coverage of uh, response options was uh, comprehensive with uh, very good uh, graphics. Could you comment on the compar uh, comparative uh, cost of the primary response options? Comparative cost of response options like mechanical burning and dispersions, um, that would be tough to give a uh, cost comparison also because it actually is never factored in the response. Whatever cost, it's cost. So this one factor that's definitely not a part of our net environmental benefit analysis. If there is a spill, uh, all resources will be thrown uh, into it. And we, uh, as a community, emphasize prudent over response. So we will mobilize all the response techniques uh, that are available and 
yes, I don't have an answer on that, but I want to emphasize that costs are not considered during spill response. We will bring everything that's needed. Yeah, and I think a uh, uh, team has worked with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dagmar Atkin mm -hmm. before yes. that, uh, you know, there are some publications on the cost of uh, the response options. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yes, Dagmar has some of the publication on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent presentation of the content of the chapter. Uh, could you expand a bit more on the improvements in monitoring techniques and the feedback loop and how it factors into decision making and how clean is a clean uh, conundrum? Yes, that's uh, maybe a topic for its own seminar. And uh, it's uh, obviously comprehensive kind of uh, issue we are doing monitoring in the field and we need to understand that sometimes it's immediate knowledge and sometimes we are taking samples and they become a result only a few weeks. So this is something that response professional knows and uh, we call it many kind of operational and scientific monitoring. So if it's operational monitoring and you're doing something to get immediate feedback to the response, uh, uh, can, uh, responders, it may be, for example, monitoring of this person's effectiveness. So you apply this person's and you do monitoring and you immediately see whether it's working or not. And then you can give uh, comments to responders uh, to continue to use this technique or not. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes when you do uh, monitoring of uh, parameters or, or uh, taken samples of uh, water quality, you will find out what's the, what's the concentration of uh, hydrocarbons in that location at some point of time, but it won't be in the next week, maybe. And how clean is clean? That's another interesting topic, especially relevant for the shoreline cleanup. And we continuously monitoring um, how, for example, cleanup is going and whether we uh, see improvements. And if not, maybe we decide to use different tactics or maybe uh, surface washing agents, uh, for example. And then we would determine uh, as a community and environmental unit, what would be our target, how clean is clean, and also how would we monitor and confirm that this target has been met. So this is a really uh, different answers, probably, whether we are talking about monitoring of a shoreline cleanup on a shoreline uh, real-time operational monitoring of offshore dispersal operations, for example, or it's a sampling and monitoring more related to natural resource damage assessments. And uh, we as a community have instructions for all of them and API and IP can industry guides on this topic. If you shoot me an email, I can send you more detailed information. Great. Um... So there are a lot of uh, thank you and uh, excellent uh, presentation. And there is one question comment. So when we think of a biodegradation after this person, is it not depend on the oil type and the specific uh, compounds within the dispersed oil, for example, higher molecular weight, aromatic uh, chemicals, uh, uh, comort to lower uh, molecular weight uh, aromatics? Yes, excellent question. And we have absolutely excellent section in this report on biodegradation. That's something that's in great advances. And maybe the next presentation, you will hear something about that because microbial genomics and our understanding of uh, biodegradation of oil really improved in the last 10 years. So there is a lot of information that we provide in the report about it. I am not an expert in that particular field. But yes, of course, biodegradation of oil happens based on individual components. So smaller molecules, uh, straight chains are easier for bacteria to uh, degrade. So they degrade them first and likely some of them are also more toxic. So bacteria help us to eliminate them from the environment. And if oil is composed of a large amount of heavy fractions like resins and asphaltines, of course, uh, by the time bacteria get to degrade those, it, this process will go much slower. And by the way, it's not one bacteria that degrades everything. Bacterial communities and environment, they change whether they need to degrade alkanes or uh, you know, some other aromatics or heavier molecules. 
So likely by degradation goes better on the smaller and more toxic and more mobile uh, fractions. And once the oil is degraded to asphalt since it's uh, really not as toxic anymore because these components are not soluble. And even if they are present in the environment, they are not as dangerous as fresh oil, for example. And you can think about asphalt on our road. Uh, we know asphaltic molecules don't biodegrade well because we still have uh, asphalt on our roads and we can use that. That's the evidence that molecules in heavy oils don't completely disappear uh, by biodegradation, but also if these molecules are left, oftentimes they have much lower toxicity than the initial product. Yeah, uh, also uh, a lot of... Uh... Uh, continuous <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, congratulations on the great talk and one question is uh, can you comment a bit more on R&D needs from responders perspective for, for marine spills of new fuels for example biofuels yes so there has been uh, several projects and one project that just ended uh, end of last year i believe it's called imaros and it uh, was uh, conducted by cedra in france in, with collaboration with uh, several other uh, parties um, i would uh, invite you to explore uh, that report and they talk about these new fields and the research is needed in all topics uh, of uh, this whole life cycle of the spill and we highlight it in our report because first we are struggling with even basic composition and chemistry of these fuels because they are blend to specification for low sulfur and they need to meet some poor point and viscosity criteria but you can see in some of these recent reports that their appearance can be completely different it can be very clear or very dark and we often don't even know what's in there Till we do chemistry. So once this product spilled, that's the first what we need to figure out. What's the composition? If we know the composition, then we can use all available knowledge to forecast how it will behave, but sometimes even composition is unknown. So that is one key need for understanding. Then another research uh, that's needed in this regard is to understand how this chemical blends, or maybe even new products that will be coming on market, uh, behave in the environment, how thin they spread, are they clear, can we see them with remote sensing techniques, are they dispersing naturally, um, how they behave in a different environment in Arctic versus temperate water, so that's something that needs to be studied, and then of course their impacts, their toxicity, because difference in chemical formulation can be quite different from one another, so it's not even a blanket statement or conclusion what impacts would be. Again, depending on the chemistry, we will need to figure out what would be impacts in different environments, what will be their biodegradations and persistent persistence. And uh, relevant for this chapter is how are we going to respond to them? Because if they spread uh, easily and form such thin sheen that we cannot recover them, maybe we have to rely on natural biodegradation. If they uh, behave like crude oil, maybe we can use conventional tools, but some concerns were that some of these uh, new fuels have higher pool point, which means they become this waxy semi-solid substances when spilled at sea, meaning our conventional skimmers and pumps will not be as effective. So we will need to use different uh, techniques on this. Likely we do have in our oil spill response organizations techniques and experience to deal with even boxy and semi-solid products, but we need to make sure to mobilize the right product uh, to the side because this oil may be changing very quickly and what you're starting with, it's not something that you will end up responding three days from now. So there is a variety of topics that can be studied for new fuel oils. Great. Yeah, great information. And following that question, uh, so, yeah, there are still gaps between academia research and, uh, you know, actual, you know, uh, oil, spill techno oil spill response technology advancement, right? I just wondering, uh, are there any opportunities for academia to be engaged in the response? Yes, there is absolutely opportunity for academia to uh, study different aspects of oil spill response. I would very much encourage them to reach out to practitioners like myself and uh, 
specialists from government or other oil companies or response organizations, and we will be very glad to work with you to provide you this information about practical challenges and aspects of oil spill response and what we are seeing in the field and help you design laboratory studies that would be more representative of field conditions. So the data that you will generate, then we will be able to kind of take into consideration and best practices. So I think there is a great opportunity for collaboration and also for spill response, academia may want to know that there is opportunity to participate and contribute uh, through environmental unit or scientific support coordinator. But because incident command system is such a structured system, it's a military-like organization because we have to respond to spill quickly and efficiently. Uh, we cannot just let people not trained in the system come into hot zone without special training. So if you're interested, you can receive ICS training, you can get engaged in the regional response team meetings and area um, committees and uh, let uh, professionals in, in your area know that you would be interested in what capabilities you have. And uh, then if you provide this kind of resources and expertise, we do oftentimes reach out as environmental unit or scientific support coordinator professionals to academia to seek your advice on resources at risks or new technologies. And even sometime there is opportunity to set aside maybe a small section of a shoreline to do experiments and testing. But again, the first priority is people, health and safety, protecting the environment, response. But if there is an opportunity and all the parts are prepared to act on it, there may be also opportunity for some research, but it has to be very well planned for. So I would encourage academia to reach out to us in advance. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, so for future um, research program, for example, uh, to improve uh, spill response technologies, any recommendations for future development? Specifically for something? Um, just uh, like in general for spill uh, technologies, uh, if there are future uh, research program, do you have any recommendations of what would be the focus? So, yeah. Things yeah, like I would invite uh, people to look through the report because we specifically at the end of the chapter list multiple topics that they can focus on. We explain how it's relevant. So uh, rather than taking another hour of uh, giving my recommendation, I invite you to uh, read the end of each chapter in the report where we consistently summarized uh, exactly that. Okay, okay, great. Uh, let me check if there are more questions. Um, yep, yeah, uh, I think uh, that's... Um, that's all the questions uh, we have right now, and I want I don't want to uh, take more of your time. It's uh, eleven twenty already, and really appreciate appreciate uh, your talk today. And uh, yeah, really great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for opportunity to be here for me and on behalf of my esteemed co-authors in National Academy of Science. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for attending as well. Bye bye.